Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome to those of others. So glad that you are at Faith Bridge today as we kick off this new series. Whether you need to resync or perhaps you are syncing up for the very first time with Jesus, we're glad that you're here because we believe that God is going to do some powerful things over the next four or five weeks as we dive deep into His Word, considering. Uh, How is God going to help me move to the next level? How is he going to help me make progress in becoming the man or the woman, the boy or the girl that he created me to be? Today, we're going to be looking specifically at the topic of spiritual fitness, how to become and how to stay a spiritually fit person. Just like uh, we have to work at being physically fit, We've got to work at being spiritually fit, so we want to discuss how does that whole process work. And to guide our thinking, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, chapter 9. If you want, you can go ahead, open your Bibles and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, but you'd like to have one, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one, and that can be yours to keep as a gift from Faith Bridge. Before we jump into the message, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, you are so good to call us to yourself, to make a way for us to come back to you. Even though each one of us have uh, managed to go our own way, still your love reaches out and beckons us. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and for his sacrifice on the cross that makes the way possible. We pray now that uh, your Holy Spirit would come to be our teacher as we look into your word, and that you would guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The book of 1 Corinthians is actually a letter It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the little congregation there in the town of Corinth, Greece, which is just down the road from Athens. And the reason he wrote the letter to this church is because it was a mess. I mean, that's really the only way to describe it. Things were falling apart in Corinth. And Paul loved these people, and he didn't want that little church to fall apart. So he writes this letter addressing the many issues facing this congregation. They had a lot working against them, some of which they couldn't help, some of which they brought on themselves. One of the things that they couldn't help, didn't have any control over, was their location. The very fact that they were a congregation in the city of Corinth was a huge obstacle because in its day, Corinth was the original sin city. I mean, think Vegas on steroids. It was the place where trouble was to be found around every corner. You could get into most anything that you wanted to get into there. I'm not sure if it actually stayed there or not, but it was a place to get into trouble. People all over the Mediterranean knew for a good time you go to Corinth. So they've got this... uh, Wicked influence, really, pressing in upon the little church. But they, too, were contributing to their difficulties. Specifically, there were issues of immorality and selfishness. The immorality uh, was centered around uh, an individual, a man, who thought it was perfectly acceptable to be sleeping with his father's wife. Nothing out of the ordinary there. Just another day in Corinth, another day as a member of the Corinth congregation, Paul was going to have none of it. He addresses that forthrightly in the letter. With regard to selfishness, it manifested itself, of all places, in the Lord's Supper. Now, you have to understand, back in those days, the Lord's Supper was a a real supper, a, a covered dish, if you will. 
wasn't just a crackers and juice, but people came together for an actual meal. But at Corinth, the congregation had become divided between the haves and the have-nots. No surprise, but it was typically the haves who would provide most of the food and drink. Unfortunately, it was also the haves who wound up consuming most of the food and the drink, leaving the have-nots out in the cold. Often, the Lord's Supper would be celebrated and some would be full and others would do completely without. You can imagine the division and the anger this was creating in the congregation. So Paul writes this letter and he begins to let them know that these sorts of circumstances here are, you know, just flat out unacceptable. We've, we've got to do something about this. We're going to pick up reading in verse 24 of chapter 9. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize." Now, in order to understand what Paul is saying in these few verses, we need to clarify, first of all, what he is not saying. He is not saying that Christianity is some sort of competitive game and the winners earn God's love, that we're all in competition with one another and somehow we're trying to get God to love us. That is not the point of Paul's athletic metaphor here. What he is saying is this, as Christians, we should approach our faith with the same level of seriousness, devotion, commitment, self-sacrifice as a top-tier athlete would in his or her chosen sport. And just as a top-tier athlete can't be nonchalant about practice, can't eat whatever they want to eat whenever they want to eat it, can't just do whatever they want to do, so followers of Jesus Christ can't be nonchalant. We can't do whatever it is that we want to do. Paul says, listen, I want you to run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul is trying to impress upon them. Listen, God has raised you up for a purpose, but you're losing it. You're blowing it. It's time to turn things around and begin to get serious and begin to pay attention to the sort of person that God wants you to be. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Run so that you will win. Win being a life that is lived for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ and for the good of other people as we represent his kingdom. Now, you don't have to tell me that we live in a competitive culture. I understand that fully. As a matter of fact, it was impressed upon me from a very young age. I remember when uh, my siblings and I were small, uh, we would invite my dad to play games with us, whether it was a board game or a backyard ball game, whatever the case was, we always wanted dad to come and play with us. And he would always remind us before he would step into the ring, boys, if I'm going to play a game, I only play for one reason, and that is to win. So I don't want to see any tears. I don't want to see any complaining or crying when I win this game. Well, I don't know that Paul ever said anything quite like that to the Corinthians, but he is letting them know this is serious business. I'm not kidding around here. You people are in trouble. Things are going the wrong direction, and it's time we turned them around and moved in the right direction. Now, thanks be to God, we don't have any of those 
types of shenanigans going on around here at Faith Bridge. But nevertheless, Paul's words, I believe, are very instructive for us as we sink or resink in our relationship with Jesus, as we seek to go to the next level, becoming the man or woman that he created and called us to be. And there are two components to this spiritual fitness that Paul is, is calling the Corinthians to. He calls them to put forth effort, and he calls them to practice self-control. And those same two components are integral to our ability to grow in our faith. And so that's what we want to look at this morning. How do we put forth the necessary effort to live for Christ? And how do we exercise self-control when temptation and the um, desire within us to move off track is so frequently present? First, I want to talk about effort. Now, even as I say that, I'm aware that some of you right about now are getting a little bit nervous, wondering, oh my goodness, is Pastor Dan drifting over into works righteousness? Is that what this is all about? That somehow we've got to earn God's love? Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Paul is saying in this passage. We can't earn God's love. It's a free gift to anyone who would receive it. Even if we tried to earn it, we couldn't do enough. God is holy and we are not. He had to extend his love as a free gift if we were going to get his love. There is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us any less. God's love is a free gift. But as one of my favorite writers, Dallas Willard, says... While God is always opposed to earning, he is never opposed to effort. Never. God loves it when we put forth our very best effort for him as an expression of devotion, commitment, and love. In verse 26, Paul says, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, listen, in this journey with Christ, I'm not going to waste time and energy. No, I'm going to be intentional about this. And intentionality is a huge part of our journey with Christ. We cannot be passive in our Christianity God is expecting that we are going to step up and we are going to begin to live lives that are pleasing to him and that are salt and light in a culture that desperately needs it. We've got to be willing to step up to the plate and say, yes, I will do what you want me to do, God, and I won't wait around for you to ask me to do it. I'm going to show some initiative here and I'm going to make some things happen by your grace and with your love. I am going to move forward in my Christian life. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate it this way. Nobody ever won a marathon by accident. Nobody ever ran in a marathon by accident. I can say that with confidence because back in the year 2000, uh, I had a temporary lapse in sanity and decided to run one of those things. But I realized early on, I couldn't just show up at the start line and have any hopes at all of finishing. I mean, we're talking 26 plus miles here. And so I took an entire year to get ready for this race. In addition to uh, having a lapse in sanity, uh, I also happened to pick one of the hilliest marathons in the United States, the Atlanta Marathon, of all things. 
I took a whole year getting ready for this thing. And during that year, uh, I paid careful attention to my running regimen. I had certain goals that I had to hit along the way. I paid careful attention to my diet, to my overall health, to my sleep, getting adequate rest. There were certain activities that I could partic participate in. There were other activities I avoided for fear of getting injured and not being able to run. There was nothing accidental about that whole experience at all. And thanks be to God, I did manage to finish within the five-hour time limit that they imposed upon all the runners. It wasn't the most impressive time by any stretch, but I finished. And in large measure, the reason that I finished is because I was intentional about it. If you and I are going to live successful Christian lives, and let me say what I mean by that word successful. I'm not talking about measuring by the world's success of fame or riches or any of those things. I'm talking about a life that is fully devoted to Jesus and that is living out his purposes for your life in the place where he has you. If we're going to have a successful life in Jesus Christ, we've got to put forth effort. The Corinthians' biggest problem was they were lazy. They wanted a trophy just for showing up. That mentality has worked its way into our culture as of late. Everybody wants a trophy and everybody feels like they deserve a trophy, but that's not the way life works. God is calling us to something higher than being a passive pew sitters. People who come in for a little check-in, with God on Sundays and then go about our business all the rest of the week. No, this morning God is stepping into your world and is saying to you, I want more from you. I expect more from you and I dare say God deserves more from us. He gave his only son for the forgiveness of our sins and for the hope of eternal life. It's not too much to ask that in light of that forgiveness and the promise of eternal life, that we turn around and we give our very best for God. Is it? I don't think so. If we're going to live the life that God has planned for us, it's going to require some effort. And maybe today is the day that God is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, okay, it's time to get up and it's time to get busy. There are some things that we have to do. In order to help us grow up, God has seen fit to give us certain spiritual disciplines. Just as uh, an athlete has to discipline him or herself and go through certain routines to compete, to live a successful Christian life, God has given us certain spiritual disciplines. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the various disciplines that God has given us to practice, the things that he wants us to do in order to grow in our faith. Today, I want to talk about just one, and that is Bible reading. Now, I know for a great many of you here, that is not new news. Tell me something I don't know, Pastor Dan. Of course, Bible reading is fundamental to being a Christian, right? Okay, but let me ask you this. Are you doing it? I mean, if it were possible to, to shine a light into the deepest places of your heart and, and see the truth, would the truth reveal that, yes, you are a person of the Word? You are regularly reading and engaging and drawing truth from God's Word and applying it to your life. Or might we learn something else? For others of you, perhaps just starting out in your journey with Christ, uh, Bible reading is not such an elementary concept. As a matter of fact, it might be rather frightening, and I can understand why. After all, it is a big book. It can be rather intimidating, and perhaps you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I wouldn't even know where to start. And what if I do start and get into it, and I get some weird interpretation, go out and start some crazy cult? What, what do I do then? I understand that. There was a day when the Bible was a big, intimidating book for me too, but it doesn't have to stay that way. No, God has made his word quite accessible for all who desire it. 
And so this morning, for just a few minutes, I want to give those of you who need a skill, who need an approach to the Bible, I want to give you one. It's a very simple approach to reading Scripture that yields tremendous benefits if we will stick with it. If you've been around Faith Bridge, you've heard Pastor Ken talk about it any number of times. It's called the SOAP method of reading the Bible. SOAP, of course, is an acronym. Each of the four letters stands for a different step in reading the Bible. S stands for Scripture, O for observation, A for application, and P for prayer. And it works like this. I would recommend to you, if you've never read God's Word or you haven't read it that much, I would recommend to you that you start with the Gospel of John, fourth book in the New Testament. It tells the story of Jesus, and John is a very readable writer. I would recommend that you start by reading one chapter a day, just one chapter. On average, John's chapters take anywhere from four to five minutes to read, reading slowly. As you read, have a notebook and pen or a laptop, whatever you prefer, so that as you read your chapter, you're looking for one, maybe two verses at most that speak to you, that seem to be something that God has for you that day. I mean, all of it, of course, is for you. But on any given day, one or two verses probably are going to jump off the page at you. Write it down. That's the first step. Scripture. Let's say you're reading in John chapter 3 and you come across John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If that's what jumps off the page at you, write it down on the top of the page or type it into your laptop. There's step one. You've identified the scripture. Step two is making simple observations about that verse. We're not looking for anything theologically complex, biblically deep. We're just looking for what does this say? When I look at John 3.16, the things that appear to me on the surface are, God loves the world, therefore he loves me. God sent Jesus to the world, therefore he sent Jesus to me. And as I believe in Jesus, I have the hope of eternal life. Those are right there on the surface, easy to grab, easy to comprehend. Step two, write down those simple observations. Step three, begin to think about how you can apply those verses to your life so that you're not just gaining information, but you're learning how to live for God in a way that he wants you to live. Perhaps a person reading John 3.16 for the first time would say, I've observed that God loves the world and loves me and that he sent Jesus for me. And so my application today is to receive him, to receive this gift and to believe so that I can have the hope of eternal life. And you'll write that down as your application. And then step four is praying, Lord, Help me to understand this passage more deeply. Help me to live it out more faithfully. Scripture, observation, application, prayer. I promise you, if you're not much of a Bible reader and you will begin to implement that very simple plan, you're going to find the Bible to be incredibly readable. It will be quite accessible and it will begin to change your life. God wants to speak to each and every one of us. He is not silent. That's why he gave us the Bible. One of the ways that we can demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we are serious about our faith is by picking it up and reading it and demonstrating to God and to ourselves, yes, I'm willing to put forth the effort necessary to grow. The other thing that God is looking for from us beyond putting forth the effort is the practice of self-control, self-denial. In verse 27, Paul says, No, 
I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. Now, again, he's not literally saying that he goes around beating on his body. Uh, What Paul is saying here is this. I'm the master of my appetites and not the other way around. I decide what my body is going to do. My body does not decide for me. I will not be appetite driven. But I will exercise through the power of the Holy Spirit self-control. I will be able to say yes to what is good and no to what is bad. Since World War II, our culture has become increasingly, now almost exclusively, appetite-driven. It's all about getting what we want, when we want it, and to whatever degree we want it. And concepts like self-denial, delayed gratification, self-control, those are foreign concepts to many of us. And for some of us, they're downright strange. Why would you deny yourself? It's there. It's not hurting anybody. Why not partake of it? We don't partake of it because God doesn't want us to partake of everything. Paul understood that self-control is central to spiritual growth. It's a non-negotiable. You can't say yes to everything and expect to grow. Any more than an athlete can say yes to anything and expect to win the race. You can't chow down on fattening food and expect then to compete. It just doesn't happen that way. God is calling us to a place of self-control. Paul understood that if he was going to grow in his relationship with Jesus, he had to exercise self-control. And speaking of Jesus, not even he got to do everything that he wanted. Even Jesus had to deny himself. Last week was Holy Week and we remembered that fateful night in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was facing the cross the very next day. He did not want to undergo a brutal death. Who would? And so he prayed, Father, if there is any other way, please let this cup pass from me, but not what I will, But what you will is the most important. And he denied himself for you and for me. Because he was willing to exercise self-control and not run and not command a legion of angels to come and protect him. He demonstrated his great love for you and for me. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, For the joy set before him... Jesus endured the cross. That's the very picture of delayed gratification. He could see the joy out there, but he knew in order to get through it, he had to deny himself and take up his cross for the joy set before him. Do you know what the joy set before Jesus was? You and me. Jesus understood the only way I'm going to be able to save them, the only way I'm going to be able to truly draw them to myself is if I deny myself first and then enjoy eternity with them as their Lord. And if self-control and self-denial was a part of the path that Jesus took, how much more then should it, we expect for it to be a part of of our path. If you're going to be a Christ follower, the bottom line is this, there are some things in this world that you are going to have to say no to. No matter what the world says, no matter what your friends say, the only option for us is to say no. Because there are some things in this world that do not enhance our relationship with God, they hinder And they impede and they work to destroy. Those things are called sin. Anything that comes between us and God. 
And it's to those things that God expects we will say no. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to empower us to be able to say no. We can't have it both ways. I became a Christ follower when I was 18 years old. And for the first three years of my walk with Jesus, I worked diligently to have it both ways. On the one hand, I really did want to be a Christian, but on the other hand, I had the most difficult time leaving behind the behaviors that had been a normal part of my life prior. I, I, I had a group of friends from high school days who were masters at applying peer pressure, and I wasn't very good at dealing with it. And so time after time, I found myself compromising and trying to have it both ways. I would wake up in the morning and read my Bible and pray and journal. But then at nighttime, when my buddies would call and say, Hey, man, come on. We're going out partying tonight. We're going to get toe up tonight. Okay. I'm right there. And it was this back and forth. I, you know, I, I look back on it now from a vantage point of nearly 40 years ago, and I'm just amazed at my naivete and hard-headedness. I remember going to an older, more mature believer at one point and saying to him, my spiritual life is so dry. I mean, I just don't feel like I'm going anywhere. I can't really get any traction. Well, this guy was no dummy. And so the first thing he asked me was, well, Dan, have you got any unconfessed sin in your life? Anything that you need to repent of? I was far too embarrassed to tell him the truth, so I just lied. And I'm sure he saw right through that lie as well. Things finally came to a head when I was 21. I was working as an electrician at the time. And on a Friday night, I went out with the guys and we had a bender and just a grand old time. Uh, but then, of course, morning came and it wasn't so grand. And I had to go to work. And I remember showing up at the shop just feeling horrible. And there on the shop floor was about a half a dozen panels that needed to be wired up. And so I sat down and began wiring one of them. I was the first one there. And after, oh, I'm going to guess five, six minutes, I heard someone say, just as clearly as you can hear my voice right now, I heard someone say, that is not for you. And I turned. At first, I thought it was my boss, Carl, telling me, you're, you're wiring up the wrong panel. That's not for you. But there was nobody else in the shop. And in an instant, I knew. God was calling me on the carpet, telling me, Dan, you can't go on this way. You can't have it both ways. You've got to decide, is it going to be me or is it going to be that? That was a turning point in my life. The one and only time I can testify to ever having heard God in an audible fashion but it accomplished his purposes. I listened and I made the changes that were necessary. And all throughout my journey with Christ, right up to the present, God is still faithful to put his finger on things in my life that have no business being there. I'm still growing and I'm still resisting temptation and I'm still making mistakes, but God is always faithful to put his finger on it and say, Dan, that, that's not gonna work. And when I say yes and I obey, I grow, but when I say, ah, you know, I'll get around to that when I can, the growth stops right there. It's as simple as that. God wants us to grow. He not only wants us to resync or to sync up for the first time, He wants us to grow. There are things that God wants to do in and through your life that you can't possibly imagine today. If you had asked me 
as a dumb, naive 21-year-old? What do you think God is going to do with you in the next 40 years as you submit and obey? I could have never guessed the ways in which God would lead me to serve him in places and in ways, and the ways in which he would change me on the inside, making me a better man, a better husband, a better father, conforming me to the image of his son. He wants to do all of that in your life as well. But here's the deal. Unless you and I are willing to put forth effort and practice self-control, it's not going to happen. You can wish for it all day long. But wishing doesn't work in the kingdom. Obedience works. Effort works. Self-control works. If you want to be a spiritually fit person, those things are non-negotiables. I recently joined a, a gym... Just like I have an ongoing quest to be spiritually fit, I also have an ongoing quest to be physically fit. Not always successful, but it's a perennial attempt on my part to get there. And I really like the gym that I've joined. It, great personnel. They're smart. They're helpful. Uh, they know how to make fitness fun. I was meeting with the manager a few weeks ago, just talking to him about his philosophy of uh, fitness and his approach and that sort of thing. And he, he, he said two things. Uh, he said a lot of things, but two stuck in my mind. One was, Dan, uh, you can never out-train a bad diet. I don't care how hard you come in here and work. If you are eating like a pig, it ain't going to work. Nothing is going to change. In a similar way, we can't out-Bible read, we can't out-pray disobedience. The two are mutually exclusive. But he said one other thing to me as well. He said, Dan, one of the keys to becoming physically fit is to always put yourself in a place where you are with people who are better than you. Make sure that you are training with people who are beyond your capabilities so that you're constantly being challenged and encouraged. We need that tug to pull us along. And you know, that's true in spiritual fitness as well. That's why we are constantly promoting life in a grow group, being discipled one-on-one -on -one or in a micro group. That's where the growth happens when someone who's just a few steps down the road says, hey, I've been there. Come on, follow me. It may be hard right now, but it gets better. Community is what is needed for spiritual growth. Our desire for every faith bridger is not only that we sink or resink, but that we're all moving towards spiritual fitness. And so today, we want to put something in your hands, a very practical tool that we believe will help you begin to move in that direction. You should have found attached uh, to your bulletin this purple card. I wish you'd take it out. And uh, <clears throat> again, nothing complicated about this. It's really quite simple. I want to challenge you to begin practicing two disciplines. One, carve out some time each day to meet with God. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be a half an hour. It can be 10 minutes. But find some time in the morning or in the evening, however God has wired you, to be with Him, to be in His Word. And then secondly, I want to challenge you to come back here for the next four Sundays so that you can continue to learn how to grow and how to become the man or woman that God has created and called you to be. Now, we don't want you to feel like you're in this thing alone. And so you'll notice on the back of the card, there's a place for you to write your name and provide us with some contact information, either a phone number or an email. Why are we asking for that? Because... Our leadership team here at Faith Bridge has made a commitment to you. We're going to divide these cards out 
among our team members. And we are going to pray for you every single day during this sermon series. Trusting that God is doing a work in you to help you grow. And we want to be able to let you know. We want to be able to drop you an email or send you a text and say, Hey, I am praying for you. God wants to do amazing things in your life and God wants to do amazing things in Faith Bridge. Not so we can pat ourselves on the back and say, look at us, how great we are. But because there is a world out there that desperately needs to know Jesus. And the only way they're going to learn about him is if people like you and me grow up and tell them about him. You can't give away what you don't have. So the challenge is here. And in just a few moments, uh, I'm going to pray for us. And after I pray, you'll have a minute or two to, to fill it out. And then the ushers will come down and collect these cards. Now, whether you're filling out a card or not, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stay seated. It, it, if you're not filling out a card, pr pray for the people who are. But this is a sacred moment. I believe, when God wants to do something in some people's lives. So let's just stay where we are for a few more minutes. And after the cards have been filled out and the ushers have retrieved them, then I'll come back out here in the east and Pastor Ken will come back out in the west and we will be dismissed at that time. Let's take a moment and pray together. Lord, I thank you that you love us enough that you won't leave us alone. You won't let us be lazy. You won't let us turn inward and selfish. But you're constantly calling us out of ourselves, toward you, toward other people. Lord, we need your grace if we're going to grow. If we're going to put forth effort, we need the power of your Holy Spirit. If we're going to be people with self-control, we need the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you impart that to us today, please? And for each individual who fills out this card, I pray, Lord, this would be a significant day. Not just another day where they dropped something in a basket, but where they did business with you. Thank you for loving us enough that you'd give us this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, the young adult pastor here at FaithBridge. I'm sitting here with Dan, who just preached a message called Spiritual Fitness, starting our new series, Resync. Uh, we have a few questions, so we can just jump right into the first one. Um, that being, what is the difference between effort and works righteousness? Well, let's begin by defining works righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, works righteousness is an attempt to earn God's love, to get God to love us based on our behavior. Right. If we keep the rules, then God loves us. That's the approach of works righteousness. It is the opposite of grace, which is recognizing that God's love is a free gift, undeserved, mm -hmm. but a free gift. So I would pinpoint the primary difference between the two uh, as um, revolving around motive. Mm. Why are you doing what you're doing? <clears throat> if, if you're behaving in a certain way because you know God loves you, that's effort. On the other hand, if you're doing what you're doing to get God mm -hmm. to love, you're not sure of it, and you're hoping that somehow this is going to bump you up the ladder a little bit, right. that's works righteousness. Um, and it's easy to slip into that. I, you know, yeah. I, I think all of us kind of go back and forth from time to time, especially in the aftermath of sin, mm -hmm. when we know we've blown it. Uh, our inclination can be to put forth a little extra effort, you know, right. to make up. Yeah. But that that's not in God's um, economy. Mm -hmm. 
He, he doesn't measure things that way. He, he is a God of grace. Mm. And uh, we probably work more than we have to right. to experience His love. Right. Yeah, that's such a good reminder of the motivation. And even for people that have been believers for a while, constantly checking our motivation. Of, sure. Are we working for it? Are we working out of God's love? Right. Cool. Well, we have one other question, and that is, <clears throat> what are some ways to cultivate self-control? Well, uh, it would be great, of course, <clears throat> if we could just decide. <laughs> yeah. From this day forward, self-control. Unfortunately, my life anyway, it doesn't work that way. And so I have to build certain things into my life that, uh, as the question says, will help me cultivate it, will enhance my ability mm -hmm. to exercise self-control. And none of them are going to come as any big surprise. <clears throat> at, the, at the top of the list, of course, would be daily meeting with God, mm -hmm. uh, drawing upon that time of prayer and being in His Word imparts strength to us. Right. Uh, any number of times I've found myself in a potentially uh, compromising situation and reflected on my quiet time from that morning and was able just to, nope, not going to go there, yeah. walked away. Uh, another huge help is uh, community. Mm, yeah. Hanging around like-minded people. Uh, I, I have two men in my life uh, with whom I have an accountability relationship, and we meet regularly to confess sin, and uh, really nothing is off limits. Uh, we're, we're, we're free to ask one another whatever we want mm -hmm. uh, so that we can continue uh, to live lives of purity and holiness. <clears throat> there have been times <clears throat> that I have been tempted to do something I know I shouldn't, and I've remembered, oh boy, that means I'm going to have to confess it mm -hmm. to my two friends, so I've had the strength then to, to walk away. I, I'll tell you one way that does not work Okay. that I've actually had people uh, not so much suggest to me, but perhaps offer um, <coughs> as a, uh, an explanation for why they did something. You can't develop self-control by putting yourself in positions where you have to exercise self-control. <laughs> it's not like a muscle. Yeah. Uh, you're setting yourself up for failure. Right. You know, we need to take a lesson uh, from Joseph and... Sometimes the most prudent thing to do is just run. Mm -hmm. Potiphar's wife is there. Just get out of there. You, you're not going to impress God yeah. with your abilities to stand in the face of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's probably just going to think, what, what are you doing? Why are you putting yourself there? You know. So those simple sorts of things, I think, can go a long way towards uh, helping a person exercise self-control. Yeah, those are all really good things to... Um, either here for the first time or just here, remember and constantly so we can all cultivate that. Good. Well, Dan, thank you for the message. Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.